Captain Lowe. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have your own copy of Cobain's autopsy report before this year? I was not happy with the investigation and I just, they didn't put anything into it and it showed. Yeah. Uh, there's more that we'll get to in, in the end about that. I want to ask you a little bit more about that and what so do I. Yeah. happened. <laughs> yeah. but, We're um, get meanwhile, I just want to do a quick follow-up to mm -hmm. that last question. Um, what are some of your other frustrations that you've had as a captain? on the Seattle Police Department, whatever it might be, whatever division you might have um, been commanding. I think I wrote a note or two on that because there are there are frustrations. Uh, well, hmm. well, I'm thinking of one. I'm trying to think of how to tactfully approach it. Um, in, I, I'm going to go back to all the way to the academy. Some of the academy curriculum, even when I went through 50 years ago, was dictated by people outside the police department. In yeah. Seattle, they've always been suspicious of the police. And I didn't know that there had been corruption um, at large scale before I came on. But it wasn't that they were just trying to clean that up. They also wanted to make cops more sensitive. So I got psychology and I got sociology and a lot of extra classes. And we had people come in and touchy-feely stuff back in the early 70s. And I thought, what has this got to do with police work? Well, that continues on into the modern era with people they promote. Um... And a lot of the training, which is generally lost on the people. Now, Tom knows I went to the seminary. And that might have softened me up quite a bit to kumbaya and uh, mm -hmm. group hugs and stuff like that. Not entirely. <laughs> and we refer to you as Father Low. <laughs> oh, I got called that when I was a detective. I was going to ask you, what's, what's this I hear about you almost becoming a priest? <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, oh, okay, let's deal with that. Let's see if I can remember where I'm going with this. Well, let's just come back to the outside influences are crushing the department. You know, uh, well, let's get to that. Just remember George Floyd and the, and the outfall of that. During my career, there's been like four or five of those, and it, we're always inundated. You guys need cultural sensitivity training. Have you talked to me? Have you interviewed me? Have you ever heard me using that in mom or anything? Yeah. Why do you think I need this? Do you want me to teach the class because of my seminary? What? What? Anyways, um, why well, went to seminary? <laughs> I remember having a friend tell me that uh, you hated, you grew up Catholic, and you hated it. And so you say, well, if I'm stuck being one, I'm going to be the best. And so <laughs> I, I, I went to the seminary, but there's a whole lot more to it than that. Like, you know, what was going on with the family and that they were highly revered. Priests were highly revered in uh, our so socioeconomic group. And I have to tell you, I still meet with uh, some of the alumni from there uh, because they were the nicest guys. It, they were what a great group of people. And uh, we still stay in touch. Although I was only there two years, it was like, if I had, I told, told my wife this, if I had it to do again, I would have stayed, you know, at least six years, learn more Latin, learn some Greek. And the yeah. education was top notch and the school yeah. was good. But <laughs> the other part of the story, the footfall is uh, I'm there in my second year and I'm looking around and go, where are the girls? <laughs> and they say, uh, you know, this is a seminary. This is for men. And uh, there are, aren't going to be any girls here on out. <laughs> oh, 
Maybe I made a mistake. <laughs> I think my hormones started to fall. Uh, yeah, girls are pretty pretty. You know? yeah. <laughs> but that's going to be a deal killer for me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, I left. And, uh, but I think Tom and I have had a lot of conversations where I told him about uh, some of what I learned, I think I brought with me. And I, uh, uh, as a detective, I, would rather than just do the paperwork and you know, refer this case to juvenile court to juvenile court, I would work on let's try something different to fix this problem. Or this is a good kid. I don't want to see him with a criminal record. And there's one long story. I I wrote a series of short stories about that time, and they're really quite good. But um, they're in a drawer over here somewhere. But um, it does talk about wanting to do more than just refer a case to court, you know, like want to come up with a, a resolution that was good for the kid. Mm -hmm. you know. and you, on a side note there, had you always therefore been interested in writing? Because that seemed like something that was clearly within you at that time. Yeah. Um, yeah, when did that bug strike me big time? I know when I was in the Navy, I uh, had a story that, uh, well, I, I'd already had one year of college and uh, a writing class. And so I played a trick on my mom. I wrote a story about losing my hat and I treated it like it was a friend. And uh, she saved that letter. Later when I read it, I had, well, this wasn't so good. But her feedback was, oh, you really had me going there. I was in tears for a minute there, only to find out it was your hat that fell off and uh, oh, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And uh, it had been with, anyway, so... I think that said, hey, you know, maybe you got a talent here. And um, so when I was going through the police academy, Joe Wombau was uh, writing down in L.A. And uh, our PT instructor said, I want you to read the New Centurions and the Blue Knight and during our free time, which we didn't have. And I did, and I was hooked. And I think when I got to the onion field, there was something in there where Wambao stepped out of his voice as being the narrator to preaching to the officers that if you don't like this, get out. And I thought, oh, okay, you kind of broke from the story to tell this, and they left it in. And I thought, I could do better than that. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so I thought, well, then maybe you need to study writing. So I have, well, I have, or, or, or start writing it. I've got no experience and uh, my writing skills are weak at this point. So I thought I need to get experience and I need to go back to school and learn how to write. What, and I did all of that. And then, yeah, uh, that started my interest. And then when I graduated from school, I think it was 2001, I had not watched TV in about eight years. I, all of it was dedicated to going to school. And, you know, I put the kids to bed and I was like, well, what do I do? I got an hour before I have to go to bed. And I, well, what about that story? Why don't you finish the story that you started while you're in school? And so I worked that up and I was having an editor look at it. And while she was doing that one, I wrote another one. And this one came really fast, uh, Thick as Thieves. Um, and I, I could tell you about each of them, what what drove that, but that um, that came really quick. And I thought, I'm on to something here. You know, this is this is going really good. Well, this also, you know, he said, well, is that your favorite? No, this is my favorite. No, this, wh whatever you're currently writing is your favorite. But this, the first one and this one stick with me the most. Um, Can you hold it up a little more? Yeah, this one, the other line. Yeah, the underlying story, uh, there's a lot of magic involved in it. And I had to study magic to find out how it worked. And um, you say, well, why don't you just ask the magician? Well, they take an oath. They can't tell you how their tricks work. Mm -hmm. But I had to figure out how tricks of that era worked. And there were a couple people who died on stage during that era uh like catching bullets and whatnot when guns misfired i won't tell you too much about that because i go into that here 
Uh, but I had to understand how the tricks work well enough to write about them. But it's funny, I spent like two years studying magic and it's all condensed down to what I had to know is into a couple of pages. But what I'll, so that part was entertaining itself, but I got into the Russian family the, um, and how they were killed and that maybe somebody from that ended up in Washington, which was driving some of what was going on in here. So there's my tie into the uh, the Russian royal family's demise, and uh, also uh, well, Nostradamus the seer is is in that too. And so uh, we had a young Russian immigre on our department, and I gave her a copy and asked her to read it, and she got right back to me and said, "We weren't allowed to read anything about the czar." So I don't know. This is the first I've read of anything about the czar and his family and what happened to him. Hmm. So, uh, and it was the first for me because back to Catholic school, they were afraid of the Russians and we didn't study anything to do with Russia or its history. And uh, so anyways, I, I quite like that. The magic's good. Of course, there's romance in here too. I, I think I have romance in all of those so far. Common theme. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's crime fiction drama and romance is usually a part of it um wages of sin so this one looking for another story and um this one happened on Erlen's point which is right across the water from seattle and it's very rural and rustic and probably a hub of activity during the um um, prohibition and so some people made money and they were gambling and somebody raided their party and killed them all and it was there was some incredibly bad police work which i think this got me going and i thought i want to write about this um the uh chief or sheriff had to come over to seattle to try to recruit luke may who was uh kind of like the sherlock holmes of his era to and he was working with SPD building the crime lab and whatnot to go over there and help him investigate this case. And while they were gone, the deputy in charge turned it into a uh, tourist thing and charged people a quarter each to walk through the crime scene. So of course they left cigarette butts, somebody stole the nylons off of one of the victim's legs and just generally trash the crime scene uh and it's like what? so this deputy obviously came from an era of corruption and no training but um i anyways i had a lot of fun with that um i tied in some knowledge of things in eastern washington this so i have a little there's one scene where i have them transporting the key witness back from yakima which is over the hill back to seattle and that, that just sparkled i really like that one uh <laughs> that's great so and then of course crazy love uh mm -hmm. and now that one's my publisher gave me a couple dictates she said be hard on a character that is like courtney that would be kim darling in my book uh you made her look too nice and sleazy <laughs> and no romance between the two characters i don't want this to be people say oh that's just your um you know your series of alan stewart barrett award just with a different name on it so um new characters and she said why don't you make uh the lead character a very out there lesbian yeah i can do that i could do that yeah sure so that uh i actually quite like her <laughs> 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 but uh yeah and i got to make her a marine and uh uh i just had a lot of fun with her and now, crazy love is mostly based on the cobain case right it is but that oh. you wrote that a couple of years ago and well, it, it is a couple of years now because uh it was during covid and it yeah. got a very soft release um i i took it up to a store 
oh, I might have told you or not. But while I was doing there, you know, you you visit people walking by and say, hey, you're interested in my hearing about my book? I'll tell you because you're in a bookstore. He was taking a cut shortcut through the store. He wasn't there to buy a book. Yeah. And uh, so he goes, oh, the co-main story. He goes, what are you, a conspiracy theorist? <laughs> that just cut me to the quick. It's like I've heard no, that a I, couple of times. Yeah. I've <laughs> analyzed the evidence in here, and I have an opinion that, forget it, I'm not sharing it with you. <laughs> you know, you're going to have to read the book to get the opinion. But I, I that kind of crushed me to say, oh, it's like being a UFO theorist or anything else. It's like, no, I read the case. And I can tell you what the evidence says because that's what I did for a living. Yeah. And it does say not suicide. Yeah. And, and because of it was a fictional book, uh, most of your readers aren't necessarily Cobain fans. And nobody yeah. really knew that it was based on the Cobain case. Um, that's why it took two years for us to even find out about you and, and, and for us to start communicating. Right. Yeah. And there was, there was no promotion. It was very soft opening. Uh, I just, I think I just put it out there and uh, hoping people would stumble across my site. My publisher actually went out of the business. You know, I, I think she still got her shingle somewhere in the back, but she went down to LA and uh, works down successfully down there. And it's like, no no time for promotion no we didn't do any of the stuff we had done before with the other books and you are going to do a uh sequel to crazy love oh yeah Let, uh, let's talk about that towards the end of the interview okay okay let's get back sure. to that towards the end of the interview. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um getting back to the seattle police department there's something mm -hmm. i've always been curious about and maybe you can help me understand this You've been there 50 years. You, you've been a right. captain for um, how long? How many years of that? Oh, time? about 19 of that. Okay. I, yeah. It, it, uh, seven, at least 17, if not 18 or 19. Right. And yet, um, police chiefs have come and gone, like Chief Stamper, who ah. was in, in the film. And, uh, yes. And and then wanted to get away before the media kept calling him every day and asking him questions. Yeah. Uh, but he was promoted from the outside. So he was there for a few years and then he was gone. I've right. noticed every police chief that I've been aware of anyhow has been brought in from another department. They're there for a while and then they're gone. Yeah. You've stayed there throughout all this. You've seen many yeah. chiefs come and go. Why do you think Seattle Police Department promotes from the outside rather than the inside? Yeah, we, uh, we've asked that too. Uh, they did promote John Diaz to chief and Jim Pugil uh, during that. Uh, and when they get new mayors, and the mayor, um, chief serves at the luxury of the mayor. And um, Oh, I'd have to go through each mayor, but uh, this one didn't like this one for that reason. But uh, this is more my view of it. I've not heard anybody say it. But if you looked at the chiefs, I remember being up there on the seventh floor and we're having a, a meeting and I'm looking around the table and I go, oh, my God, we all went to Catholic prep schools or um, or, or I think we have. And um, I thought, well, what's the what, what drove that? Well, I think the the nuns, or in my case, the priest, uh, said, you will serve, you know, well, find your vocation, you will serve. So if you look, you say, oh, my God, it's kind of a Catholic mafia up there on, in the police department. <laughs> but it, it wasn't. But it's like, well, aren't they all boys? And occasionally a woman would come through and, and, and out. Yeah. But no, it wasn't all boys. So uh, let's start with uh, Kathy Ho Tool who I really like. Uh, she uh, was in charge of Ireland, something or other for a while. And she came out of Boston and um, she came in and they paid her twice. Oh, I killed that. I didn't know that was her. Um, with a mandate to turn this department around. And if you've ever been around, you know, somebody that's been told to be a change agent, that could be everything from the color of the uniform shirts 
Uh, everybody used to love French blue, but the new chief says, no, you're going to go with the LA PD color that everybody else has. Uh, changed the patches. Um, changed uh, all the staff on the command staff. You know, like it, it came down apparently that to uh, Pugil when he was the chief for a little bit. I want you to uh, get rid of some of your people up there, the old mafia, Catholic mafia. And so he personally fires his, the black one that all of us liked, <laughs> Nick Metz. I was like, what? He, well, fired. He demoted him to captain. I was like, what the hell's going on up there? When Nick you said probably, he, you mean she, Catherine? No, well, at this point, I'm, I'm going back to Diaz in my head. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Diaz and Pugil. Pugil demoted him, uh, the wrong guy. And then they kicked out another guy who was just stellar, but he wasn't part of the Catholic mafia. Uh, and um, he was very bitter when he left. And then, uh, so we don't see what's going on, but a lot of them get like severance packages. And then when Nick got promoted back uh, up to the chief, but then we get Kathy who comes in and says, hey, Nick, uh, you're not going to work out well for me. I'll, I'll help you. Uh practice for an oral board for Colorado or another department. So a lot of them who were chiefs went to other agencies uh, as their chiefs. But what she was doing was a house cleaning. She was going to bring up all new people, some of even who weren't even captains yet. She brought up a couple of lieutenants, which is, you know, it used to be you had to be a captain before you could move up higher. Now she picked a couple of lieutenants that she liked and which means they don't have the experience that we have. And that's why you have a chop zone, which you may have heard about on the news, where they lose a precinct. They have to seed it because they got to... Well, I was going to use the word clowns uh, running <laughs> the organization now because I'm not happy because when they show the picture, I go, that's my old office up there. They gave away this building. That was my office. And... I'm so mad at them. And uh, <laughs> then they start blaming each other and saying, oh, it was his idea. And then they cover up uh, for uh, Je Jeannie Durkin was the mayor. And that one, I won't take her off the hook. I'm sure she told Carmen, this is what I want. And Durkin didn't have any experience as a mayor. She had been a very liberal uh, federal prosecutor or something like that. And she brought that with her, but she had no uh, management of a city experience and yeah. so she but make it the summer of love and let's give them the precinct you're like oh my god worst idiot ever as <laughs> so we anyways you, kathy O'Toole, you know uh, this is going to be posted online right well i would tell her that to her face <laughs> kathy, that's <laughs> when i decided to retire was there was another city councilman uh sawant and i thought you know if i ran across her on this hill jaywalking I'd write her a ticket and or I'd pick her up and throw her out <laughs> on the hill. But, okay, if you're thinking that, you better go. So, <laughs> yeah, I thought, yeah, time for me to retire because I went from when I was the internal affairs commander to being able to walk over and talk to all the city council people to thinking, oh, my God, I wouldn't pick up your garbage if, you know, you, you guys are terrible. I don't know how they got picked. Yeah. But back to the chief's part. New new mayors, new city council. I can't work with him. Let's cut Carmen's pay, even though she's working out real well. People like her. We'll make it officer pay. And then well, she's not going to stick around for that. So she leaves and another chief comes in. And uh, I, the guy that's there now, he might be okay, but he has no, no management or command experience. Uh, wow. He was uh, promoted from uh, community relations to a sergeant community relations. And then is one, another one of those lieutenants has all of a sudden jumped up to this. So he never was in charge of any large disturbances or fights or precincts. He's got no management experience. And I really don't know how he's doing because I'm not following that closely, but um, that they're surrounded by people without good experience up there. And that doesn't make them look good. So. He'll probably be gone uh, here in a little bit um, yeah. also. But why outside? Because they didn't trust the inside. It was like when um, Kathy came in, it was like clean that hole, scrub um, it, get rid of everything. 
change the paint of the cars, change your uniforms, change all of personnel, all the civilians in the chief's office. And, and yet all, all of those things you mentioned don't really change the people who are working at, at the department. Those no, lower down. Yeah. Um, the work captains are lower, the worker bees. We don't see that politics that, as much. Of course, as a right. captain, I did. And I got to see the stuff I didn't like. But if you're down as an officer level, you it, it takes a long time for the waves to get down to you. Yeah. Well, there's something I want to bring up. And I'm going to play the role of attorney for just a minute here. I want to ask you some questions. Captain Lowe, mm -hmm. did you ever have your own copy of Cobain's autopsy report before this year? No. Yeah, no. no. Okay, Captain, did you ever send out, give, display, or disperse the original or a copy of Kurt Cobain's autopsy report in any shape, form, or manner to anyone anywhere? No, no. Do you have any idea how I got my copy of the Cobain autopsy report before I dispersed it on the internet? No, you didn't say. You didn't tell me. Was there anything in the autopsy report that caught your attention or something about it that you'd just like to talk about? Yeah, the uh, let's go with that heroin level. Uh, you know, it said 1.52 milliliters. What does that mean? Uh, I don't know. And the rest of it was a lot of, you know, as well educated as I am, I can't keep up with those medical terms, and nor am I interested in them. It's, uh, you could be speaking Greek, uh, which maybe it was. Yeah. Um, but the 1.52 milliliters, that just seems like a heap, a lot of heroin. And uh, I, I think I need something to compare it to, but I have read something. I think you showed me from a real junkie uh, that was, and then I read, I like that uh, Irish name doctor from London who right. wrote something that you attached that mix, mix something or rather. Yeah. I thought his analysis was spot on. I thought he did a really good job. And that's where I, I realized, oh my God, we were supposed to bag the hands and we didn't. And there, there could have, there should have been, blowback residue on anything that close to the head stomach maybe not so much but the head definitely yeah and particularly with a shotgun that didn't escape it should have come back and uh he didn't see any blood on that and so intuitively i i knew and i think you and i talked discussed this privately there were probably polaroids and so in my sequel which i'm about half through uh I'm adding that those details in. I think the sequel sequel is going to be pretty good, yeah. and I'm shifting my focus uh, a little bit from more information that I got from you. That you know, I don't know if we want to discuss it here. Just right, no the, ti the timeline. Yeah. And, uh, so, but then that also interests me in writing the true crime version, but. Yeah, back to the autopsy. Uh, I saw a Band-Aid on one arm and then the uh, hypodermic on the other, which, you know, we expected. But uh, it, it, you, in no way do you know who who gave the hypodermic, hypodermic shot. Mm -hmm. But I did like reading the one thing you said, or, or maybe it was that doctor, that that amount of heroin just uh would take several syringes uh to fill and i remember reading the one letter from a guy who said hey i was a big time heroin user i helped other guys shoot two needles where i didn't know that they did that and uh that after the first needle the guy's not capable of doing a second needle i he had to administer it to his friend and but if you i think in my book i um so something about cooking this in a uh, a crock pot or something like that to get that much heroin. Uh, <laughs> that would where was all the evidence of that? Did, did he just keep doing it off a spoon and reusing the spoon, which was found three feet from his body uh, yeah. in a 
a tidy fit kit and his sleeves were rolled down. And, and I thought he performed some high functioning motor skills for somebody that was, should have been incapacitated. Right. And then I, of course I go with, I'm weighing this against, this is not a man who liked pain. In fact, I think he got into heroin because of his stomach pain. Uh, and not brave or courageous or fearless or reckless as far as I know. Why didn't he just do the overdose? And so I'm going to introduce it. sleep, uh, yeah. yeah. Do the overdose, go to sleep with a smile on his face. You know? Go down into the garage where his stinking old Volvo was, turn on the key and shut the garage door. And yeah. take the heroin. And he could have it all right there and it would have been painless. Right. This is what you see with a shotgun blast to the face. It's rage.